Hey everyone, we're going to be on, this is Kristen Jensen, and I am going to be inviting um, Russ Tuttle of the Stop Trafficking Project. Here we Good. So he'll be on momentarily. Again, I'm Kristen Jensen. Oh, it works. All right. <laughs> hey, Russ. <laughs> Hi. All right. Well, we love when technology works, right? We love it. Technology is so powerful and it's such a benefit in so many ways, but it's also a tool that can be used to harm people and especially kids. So, um, hey, Heather, thanks for joining us. Um, let us know, like, if you have any questions that you want Russ to answer. Russ is the founder of the Stop trafficking project he's located right in middle america and in the midwest and you would think this would be this nice safe place um you know kansas just uh where kids would be ra relatively safe you we're not talking the big cities but unfortunately um because of technology <laughs> kids um kind of are on a level playing field in a sense when it comes to trafficking. So, hey, Matthew, thanks for joining us. Um, we're excited to get this message out. So I'm just going to start by going through a few uh, stats, and then we're going to ha have some questions for, for Russ. So once again, Russ, thanks for joining us. Um, Great to be here. Thank you. You look like you're in a little paradise out there of greenness. <laughs> um, so the average age of entry into sex trafficking in the United States is age 12 to 13. Um, how many kids are being exploited in the United States through the commercial sex industry? Over 100,000. That's like 100,000 too many. Um, What's the amount of money the sex trafficking industry brings in every year? $99 billion with a B. Billion dollars. Um, this is really sad. The average life expectancy of sex trafficked victims, if they don't get rescued, is only seven years. Um, and I know that, you know, drugs and suicide are a part of that. Um, and did you know, we, we often think of it's only girls, but actually 50% of sex trafficking victims are male. And um, let's see, the average time from the first, this is something I think I learned from, from Russ, the average time from the first interaction between a predator and a child online um, that it takes for the online predator to convince the minor to meet up in person is only eight days. Only eight days from initial contact to meet up in person. So this is a problem. Um, Russ, you, uh, do, do most parents worry about um, sex trafficking? Their kids getting involved in sex trafficking? No, and honestly, why should they, right? Because this is the best country on the planet, and everything is good, and we shouldn't have to worry about these kind of things at all. And, and yet the reality is, the sad reality is, is that on um, Sunday morning, July 10th, so just a couple weeks ago, I was actually in Washington State, and my phone started blowing up because I was receiving text messages about a little girl out of the Kansas City area who had connected with someone online she was 15 years old and her parents had the mentality that the vast majority of parents in America have that says this, not my kid. This could never happen to my kid. Mm -hmm. And what happened to this girl was the pattern that we find in all forms of online exploitation, which is at the highest level it was ever been last year the highest level of online enticement of children that we've ever seen in the United States of America. And so this little girl, um, 15 years old, was actually just engaging on various social media apps, and she was talking to different people. And this one particular person um, followed her through all the patterns of what we call casing, 
which is where they test the boundaries of a kid before the grooming process even begins. And he discovered some things in this girl as she was kind of putting herself out there. Next thing you know, he starts sharing pornography with her and then he's in love with her and she's so beautiful and she likes that. And so he begins to ask for inappropriate images and pictures, which she willingly shares because she's emotionally connected now. Long story short, it took about 10 days until she literally, July 10th, I got the text on a Sunday morning. Um, she walked away from home. Get understand that she walked away from home. There's no kidnapping. There's no abduction. There's no white band pulls up onto the street and grabs someone off and kidnaps them. This girl, 15 years old, literally willingly walked away. Um, 24 hours before I got that text on July 10th, Sunday morning. By July 10th, Sunday morning, she had gone from Kansas to Denver. And she was in Denver, Colorado, under the control of two adult males and an adult female. Um, I can tell you literally this morning, about two hours logging into this live Instagram, um, I got the message that she is home safe. You don't know how rare that is. In fact, the female police officer who was um, tasked with driving her from Denver back to Kansas City to be re with her parents wept the majority of the way because she understands how rare it is that once a child follows through these patterns and is actually now a victim of the actual crime of domestic minor sex trafficking where children in America are being raped for profit. It is so rare, Kristen, as you know, yes. that these kids ever are fully reunited back with their family situations. I, I can't when I when I read the text message, I literally broke into tears about an hour and a half, two hours ago, knowing I was coming onto this live Zoom because it is it is so rare. The problem is is that most parents in America go, "Not my kid," and that is the number one mistake parents say that there's no way my kid could fall into these things. And here's what I want to say about that: most people think this, parents especially, it is the white van pulls up onto a street, all these kind of things. Here's what I want to tell parents: the white van, the creepy white van is your kid's cell phone. So have that mentality and understand now the creepy white van is actually my kid's cell phone. And that's really what we have to talk about. Well, okay. Okay. Well, I got a question um, about, you know, what can we do to prepare our kids to protect our kids from becoming victims? And we're going to have you answer that. But before that, I think there's a concept that you talk about a lot called the um, exploitation of vulnerability. So we're going to get your, your great advice for protecting kids. But first, I want you to go back and talk about this vulnerability and how it's exploited. And um, because that's the process. And if parents understand that, they're going to be more able to protect their kids, right? You're 100% correct, Kristen. You're so right. And what, what, I want, what I want parents to understand is this, is, is I want you to take the myth of human trafficking and sex trafficking away from this word, away from the word abduction, and I want you to understand that it's actually all about seduction. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about abduction, we're talking about seduction, and the place where our kids are most vulnerable, the three words that you talked about, this concept that we use in our organization, the Stop Trafficking Project, it is, it is, is technology a problem? Technology itself is not the problem with domestic minor sex trafficking. It's the tool where vulnerabilities are exploited. So I really need adults, trusted adults, caring adults to grasp hold of these three words, the exploitation of vulnerability, and understand that more than putting bark on your phone and engaging with covenant eyes and using canopy and all the different things that we use on technology to keep our kids safer, what adults really need to start with is this. What are the vulnerabilities in the kid that I care about and how could those vulnerabilities potentially be exploited, especially online? So we're talking about the two top things that get kids in trouble online is they're bored and they're lonely. So yes, kids in foster care. Yes, kids in poverty. Yes, kids with illiteracy. Yes, kids were struggling with their sexual identity. All those things are vulnerabilities that do ramp up the easiness of their exploitation. However, most parents probably engaging on this call, they're like, my kids aren't facing all those things, right? The number one myth, right? Not my kid. Okay, but now maybe we have some lazy parenting happening and the easy babysitter is the screen time. 
So what I need parents to understand is that it's not about abduction. It's about seduction. And I want people to understand this reality that if you've got a kid who is bored or lonely, or maybe now they feel a little bit isolated from their friends or their peer groups for whatever reason, and maybe they're dealing a little bit with some sadness issues that might even lead into actual depression, these things are leading to issues where we are finding now kids increasingly through the Midwest, where we are primarily focused, um, the levels of suicide are increasing. We're finding kids increasingly yeah. under controlling relationships. We're finding cyberbullying is now exploiting kids in even further ways than they ever have been before. And we're also finding the issue of pornography as an addiction into kids at younger and younger ages is now opening them up to adult levels of vulnerability online that now takes a kid and go, well, you're really nice. You look nice. And so I think I'm going to talk to you. And these are the things that parents need to be paying attention and understanding. It's not worry about your kid walking out in the street and a white man's going to pull up. The white man is your cell phone. And don't think about your kid being abducted. It's about seduction. The girl who walked away from her house willingly yeah. from a great yeah. family. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another point. I was on a call with uh, someone who works for um, actually locally here in Washington works uh, with, you know, kids that are trafficked or, you know, uh, it's the, um, used to be the sexual assault resource center. Now they have another name, but it's the, a, a, a support center. And she was saying that of the hundred cases that she's working on right now, like 80% of them are all from, good families you know they're, they're impact functional families uh their parents are professionals even uh police officers even you know so um we can't just assume that it you know that any child is completely safe if again we need to look at their vulnerabilities you know are they lonely are they bored do they um you know, those are really strong, those feelings. You know, I I think we've all ex felt, well, I felt lonely before. And it's a terrible feeling. Um, and it can grow. And then it can develop into these other thoughts. Your thoughts can go crazy. And these kids, um, we it's not always easy to know what a kid is thinking. I know when my kids were, you know, um, of a certain like middle school age, especially, I didn't always read them perfectly. Um, but um, so, so, we've so, so what about happens? So what happens is when a kid feels lonely, isolated, depressed, wondering is white life worth living. What happens then is this. Now, so there's three kind of people's online looking for kids. I call them perverts, predators, and pimps, and they are preying on kids online. So when a kid feels bored, lonely, isolated, depressed, all these things, there are key words that kids start to put out there that people online are actually looking for. We're talking about words like brokenness, sadness. We're talking about um, looking for a friend. We're talking about um, issues that kids start to talk about of their identities, sexual identity issues. All these things become key words that these guys actually run analytics and actually run algorithms on their devices to, to seek after kids. So, so I, I was in a cyber crimes training where um, I was using the, uh, um, the kick messenger app, pretty popular, right? And so I was assigned to become a 12 year old girl. So I became Jamie Jones, one, two, three, gmail.com, 12 year old girl, no geographical location where I live, no pictures of me. And it, it, within seven seconds, Kristen, I had my first message that said this, um, hey, girl, what you doing? I'm bored. Mm -hmm. Seven seconds. Within 17 seconds, another message. Within 21 seconds, another message from the same person. And so the cyber crimes guy was helping me understand. He said this. He said, he said these people aren't even typing that. They're literally copy pasting, looking for key words that kids are posting online to then entice them in. And so, and so this is where I talked about briefly mentioning where parents need to understand what's the vulnerability of my kid. And a lot of times if people are somewhat familiar with patterns of helping kids stay safer, we typically jump straight to the grooming process. We hear that term, it's the grooming process. Now, we need to back yeah. up even before that and talk about the casing because casing actually happens before grooming. So imagine your window in your home, it has a case around it. That's the boundary. Well, you hear about people going around casing a neighborhood, looking for the vulnerable 
houses yep. that might be the right place to go try to rob. So it's, yeah, it's the, it's, it's the exact okay. same concept and they're doing that to their kids online. So then once they find that boundary that a kid is willing to cross online, that's when the actual grooming process steps in. And that can, that, that looks like so many different things. So, so um, a few years back, the, the FBI actually uh, did a report was the FBI or the department of justice. Anyway, they talked about like, what makes a child more at risk for, you know, being uh, sex sorted, right? Being, being uh, groomed or sex sorted online. And what they came up with was just sheer time online. Like kids spent a lot of time on games, uh, chatting, whatever. They are actually more at risk. The more, you know, time they spend on these apps, the more at risk they are. It didn't really correlate with um, sexual things that maybe a child might say or, or whatever. It was more like the time, the amount of time. It's kind of like when you, they, they know now that when you go in a grocery store, the more time you spend there, the more money you add down to a you know an algorithm, the more money you will spend. And so the more time your kid spends online and on these apps, the more vulnerable they will be for sure. And also then they, you know, whatever kinds of, um, you know, emotional vulnerabilities they, they will have. These people are smart. They're yep. well-trained. They know how to get kids and they specialize in various parts of this process. So, um, yeah. well, all right. What, what, what are some real uh, tangible things that parents, let's bring it together. What can parents do to uh, protect their kids? What's, you know, I know we've talked about a lot of things, so let's sure. just boom, boom, boom. Yeah, so if, if there's, a, if there, if, I believe there's a cure for human trafficking. And I think it's the simple word awareness that leads to prevention. So there's awareness that parents need to have that is not just knowledge, but it's something that they're gonna say, it's not just enough for me as an adult to have this understanding about my kid. I now need to actually engage my child in that conversation. So we need trusted adults who are actually engaged in the lives of the kids that they care about. Understanding this, listen, it's unfortunately, the vast majority of the kids that we're dealing with who are vulnerable in these areas, there's not a mom and dad in the home. So there has to be this understanding that if it's a single parent home or foster parent home, grandparents, whoever is raising a kid, ideally mom and dad, whatever that comes down to, we're going to identify them as the trusted adult. And what I want the trusted adults to understand is, is you, you don't live in fear of these devices, but you definitely need to be wise. And so what we need to do is you need to approach your child that you care about, identifying what are the vulnerabilities in this specific kid, literally identify those, write them down if you have to. Um, are, are, they, are they prone to be really quick to be angry? Um, if they're online for six hours doing something and you take them off of that, that's the kid that wants to punch a hole in the wall. It's not because they're a bad kid. It's because that's a vulnerability. So you're going to have to identify that and help that kid understand starting at the youngest ages possible. We've got to start this at younger and younger ages. So I love your books, the younger and younger ages we can do this. That's why in our school assemblies, we actually start kindergarten for age appropriate school assemblies because we have to educate, but then also empower our kids about how they can be um, safer online. So one of the things for adults to do is don't approach your kids from this perspective. You're just a bad kid. You're doing all these horrible things online. I can't believe what you're doing. What I need adults to do is recognize and understand that all the levels of vulnerability that we are allowing kids to happen to be exploited online, we've created those platforms as adults through our cell phones. And so it's kind of like we're going to give a 10-year-old kid a Ford F-150 pickup truck key and say, there's the truck, go drive it, have a great time. They've never been in it before. You got to give them some training. It's the same thing that we have to do with our kids online to pay attention to them. So I really need parents to be consistent. Parents need to know the passwords on their kids' phones. They need to be, they, they, they need their kids to understand that I'm the parent in this situation. You're the kid, this is my phone. So we actually give parents permission to be their kids' parents, not their best friends, right? Best right. friends are gonna best yeah. friends are gonna let their kids do anything they want to online. Yeah. So within that, that means I'm going to put items on your phone that are gonna allow me to monitor that. So it, whether it's Bark or Canopy and the Covenant Eyes and all the different wonderful tools that are out there, but then the parent needs to understand that in and of itself is not enough. I need to be tuned in enough to my child to know what are the vulnerabilities that they have specific to them and that anything and everything I can do to keep that from being exploited is gonna help. 
So one thing, what, I have to throw this one last thing out. I am on a rampage right now to get parents to quit posting so many pictures of your kids on social media. People absolutely do not understand the, the, the algorithms that some of the deepest depravity of perverts, predators, and pimps are taking your innocent kids' pictures and planting them into algorithms and software that's removing clothing from innocent kids, putting them in all kinds of horrific situations. Some of these images are ending up on the dark web. They're in hobbyists um, who actually engage in these things. And so I, I really want to caution parents to just be so careful with even your own posts and, and, and lead by example. And then remember, parents, you're not in this alone, right? You have Defend Young Minds. You have all the amazing resources. Um, our organization can be a resource to you as well. So you are not in this alone. And you're not the only parent dealing with this, okay? So don't let your kids think that they are alone. Good. Well, that's awesome. I love this idea of kind of get, taking it kid by kid and doing almost like an individual plan, right? Okay, these are my kids' vulnerabilities. This is how much time they're online. What's, you know, and um, we always say, don't give your kids a smartphone, you know, until you know they're responsible enough to follow the rules and have the self-discipline, um, that is needed with an F-150 Ford cell phone, basically, yeah, you know, right. it's, uh, it's huge. Uh, well, where can people, uh, you know, if, if parents want more information about your, what you do, I know you do school assemblies, I know you do lots of trainings for police, for various other groups of professionals, um, where can they find you, Russ? Because I don't know, ever since I met you at a conference, I've been so impressed with your passion and your knowledge. Um, and so where can people find you? And um, if they can't get you to come out, what, what do they do if they want more help in their school or more help in their community or church? Yeah, so you're very kind, Kristen. Thank you. And, I, and I'm a big fan of what you guys do and partner every chance we get. So really honored to be just even on this call today. Um, you can DM me through Instagram. I'm not very good at Instagram. I'm not very good at social media. I'd spend very little time on social media, actually. So probably the best thing to do is just reach out through our website, stoptraffickingproject.com. You can connect with all of our social media buttons there. And it'll take you through there. So we're on Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn and Facebook. So that's one of the easiest ways. Um, in regard to having us come um, to your communities, we're continually developing a team um, that is going to be able to go throughout the United States of America to bring these things to communities. Um, just so you know, briefly, what we do for school communities is we actually pull all the adults together surrounding a school community first. That includes law enforcement, other first responders, counselors, medical professionals, faith community leaders, school, and then y'all come, moms, dads, guardians, grandparents. And we do a training for the adults first before we go the next day and do age-appropriate school assemblies, kindergarten through 12th grade. And in, through this strategy, we're actually being able to engage in what our vision is to actually end it before it starts. Yeah. And so that's where my passion for parents is to engage your kids with awareness that's not just information, but awareness that literally leads to prevention. So all these issues we're talking to about our kids never gets into the windshield of their life as they're driving down the road of life. We don't want them to ever encounter any of these levels of exploitation. So anything we can do as a resource to the Stop Trafficking Project, again, it's just stoptraffickingproject.com. Um, that links you to, you can email me through that. You can connect with all of our social media opportunities through uh, there as well. All right. Well, Russ, thank you so much for all you are doing to inform and educate. I know you truly care about kids. I've heard so many of the stories. And, folks, we have a, a wonderful interview that we did with Russ where you can get even more information about what he does and, and um, on our website, defendyourminds.com. So just uh, look into that. Thank you so much, Um Appreciate all that. You guys we, should invite homeschool we, families. We, 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 yes. we go to homeschools a lot. We do a lot of co-op homeschools. So, yes. Awesome. Yeah, homeschool co-ops can be very powerful. Um, yep. So, all right. Well, thank you so much, Russ. Thank Have you. a great rest of your summer. And thank you so much for taking the time uh, to be on with us today. Absolutely. I'm on my way in 10 minutes to go do some highway patrol training for the state of Missouri. Oh, wow. All right. Well, good. Timing. good. That's great. I'm, I'm the state of Missouri. You go. I mean, that's great. Yay, Russ. <laughs> Take care, Kristen. Appreciate you. All right. Bye-bye.